Well, good morning. So good to be worshiping with you this morning, and thanks also to those of you who are tuning in to watch remotely. My name is Chad Barber. I'm senior pastor here at EP. If you are visiting with us for the first time or for the first several times, welcome. We are so glad that you're here with us this morning. If you would, look in the back of the pew in front of you, and you'll find these little cards called Connect Cards. If you would please fill out your information to let us know that you worshiped with us and just put it in the offering plate when it comes by, we'd be really grateful. Well, last week we finished a sermon series on the armor of God where we talked every week about how we are in a spiritual battle. Um, And as we turn to our new series, uh, something that we are going to return to again and again is the fact that there are times in our Christian experience where we need replenishment. We need to be poured into by God to be refreshed. And that is what worship is in the Christian life. And there's not a better book in the Bible that talks about worship than the Psalms. And so we're going to spend um, a couple of months just in the Psalms going into depth and, and how we worship God in our daily experience. And so today we're going to talk about singing in the shadow. And what it means that even though we're going through tough times, when we're feeling dry, we can, we can experience God in the sweetest ways. And so I invite you now in the next few moments as you hear the music to take a moment to read the reflection on the front of your bulletin. Meditate on Jesus who is the one that pours into us and prepare your hearts for worship.
Please stand and join me in the call to worship from Psalm 29. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord the glory, do his name. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. Please remain standing for the next hymn medley. We're going to sing both hymns 646 and 700. Would you please please join me this morning in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom, 
and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Uh, you remain standing. Um, the Westminster Confession of Faith provides helpful summaries for us of God's truth from Scripture. Today's confession comes uh, from Westminster chapter 21, which is speaking about religious worship and the Sabbath day. Would you join me in professing this biblical truth? Natural understanding reveals that there is a God who is Lord and sovereign over everything, who is good and does good to everyone, and who is therefore to be held in awe, loved, praised, called upon, trusted in, and served with our heart, soul, and might. The acceptable way of worshiping the true God is established by God himself. God's revealed will so defines and outlines proper worship that neither the imaginations and devices of men nor the suggestions of Satan are to be followed. This morning's Old Testament reading is from 2 Samuel 15, 13 to 17, verse 23 and uh, 16, 5 through 11. Uh, in your bulletin and also in the Pew Bible, page 339 to 340. This is the word of the Lord. And a message came to David saying, the hearts of the people of Israel have gone after Absalom. And then David said to all the servants who were with him at Jerusalem, Arise, and let us flee, or else there will be no escape for us from Absalom. Go quickly, lest he overtake us quickly and bring down ruin on us, and strike the city with the edge of the sword. And the king's servants said to the king, Behold, your servants are ready to do whatever my lord the king decides. So the king went out, and all his household after him, and the king left ten concubines to keep the house. And the king went out, and all the people after him, and they halted at the, at the last house. And all the land wept aloud as all the people passed by, and the king crossed the brook Kidron, and all the people passed on toward the wilderness. In chapter 16. When King David came to Baharim, there came out a man of the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shimei, the son of Gera, and as he came, he cursed continually, and he threw stones at David and at all the servants of King David, and all the people and all the mighty men were on the right, his right hand and on his left. And Shimei said, as he cursed, get out, get out, you man of blood, you worthless man. The Lord has avenged on you all the blood of the house of Saul, in whose place you have reigned. And the Lord has given the kingdom into the hand of your son Absalom. See, your evil is on you, for you are a man of blood. Then Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, said to the king, Why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Let me go over and take off his head. But the king said, What have I to do with you, you son of Zeruiah? If he is cursing because the Lord has said to him, Curse David, who then shall say, Why have you done so? And David said to Abishai, and to all his servants, Behold, my own son seeks my life. How much more now may this Benjaminite leave him alone and let him curse, for the Lord has told him to. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. 
our hearts are fickle. Thankfully, Jesus knew just how flaky and how distractible we are, and he gave us means for our humbling and realignment. As we confess our sins corporately this morning, and uh, we do so privately, know that in every way you have dishonored God, God has already known about it. The confession that we are speaking together um, is, is part of the command by Jesus to confess of our sins because through the power of the Holy Spirit, repentance of sin grows us to be more like God. So as we repent together, remember that we are dwelling on our smallness, our frailty, our sins, and ask the Lord to take them from you and realign you with the true God of perfection, of goodness, of eternal hope. Uh, Through repentance, we become more like Christ. Please join me on page four of your bulletin as we read the corporate confession of sin. O almighty and merciful Father, you pour your benefits upon us. Forgive the unthankfulness with which we have required your goodness. We have remained before you with dead and senseless hearts, unkindled with love of your gentle and enduring goodness. Turn us, O merciful Father, and so shall we be turned. Make us with our whole heart to hunger and thirst after you, and with all our longing to desire you. O Lord, please hear our prayers now. Heavenly Father, we thank you for casting our sins as far as the east is from the west. Lord, we ask that you would welcome us back with open arms through the atoning work of your Son, and that even though we fail to acknowledge you as Lord in our, in our daily lives, that you would bring us back to you each and every day. Lord, thank you for hearing us this morning. Uh, Please draw us closer to you in this week to come, that your blinding beauty may overshadow the desires we have toward sin and impurity. Uh, Please now hear this assurance of pardon. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Amen. Um, I would love to direct your attention to page 11 of of the bulletin. On page 11, we have our church's mission uh, outlined, to change lives through sharing Christ. And we do that in three different ways. We gather to worship, we disciple to grow, and we send to share the faith with others. There is a lot happening in the next few weeks, so this may be... uh, a couple additional seconds than normal. So this is the pausing moment where our note takers, you are welcome to get out your, uh, your pens and pencils if you would like. Um, but under the category Disciple to Grow, uh, we have our women's Bible studies and men's Bible studies uh, meeting again this week. Our women's Bible study meets on Tuesday evenings at 6.30 p.m. and our men's Bible study on Thursday mornings at 8 a.m. Uh, you are welcome to join, and uh, the contact information is there on, on page 11 uh, for you as well. Um, under the category, Send to Share the Faith, um, again, we have a lot taking place. The first thing I want to um, draw your attention to is our missions committee has just released its July to September Missionary Prayer Guide. 
Uh, the guide provides pictures and summaries of eight different missionaries and ways to keep their ministries in prayer. Uh, these missionaries are serving all around the world and ask on a regular basis for you to keep their ministries in prayer because they know that they will not be successful unless it is the Lord who does that work. And the Lord has called us to pray and intercede for one another's ministries. Uh, so you will find a copy in this week's online epic newsletter. So take a look online in your email for that. Uh, the second thing is Vacation Bible School is right around the corner. It is coming up. The dates are July 17th to 21. Uh, you'll, no you'll also notice that it is from 9 a.m. to noon. If you're volunteering, it'll be a little bit earlier. And if you're helping to clean up, it might be a little bit later. But this year's theme is Stellar, uh, Shine Jesus' Light. This is something that every single youth in our community needs to hear. And uh, thankfully, we have found most of the volunteers that we need. But if you can think of a way that you might be able to assist or volunteer in a special way, please do reach out to Debbie Freer. Uh, for those who are signed up or interested in helping with decorations, decorating will be taking place this coming week. Uh, so pay attention to your emails for reminders. Um, there is also a special need for someone to help drive families to VBS. So in particular, we have two families who are in need of rides from the Bear area to EP each and every day for VBS. If you would be willing to help and volunteer in this capacity, please also speak with Debbie Freer. Uh, her email is on the back of the, back of the bulletin. Um, now, the final and biggest need of VBS is for uh, each of you to be involved in inviting your neighbors. So there are these postcards in the back um, Narthex, and they have all the information about VBS, what it is, what it's like, and I mean, it's a conversation starter. You're not going to get everything from these note cards, but it is enough uh, to invite someone and to start a conversation. And we ask that you would invite your friends, your family, your neighbors. It's okay if they go to another church. It's okay if you haven't met them before. Uh, be bold. These cards are for you um, to take and uh, help us do what this event is intended to, which is to be an outreach into our community, to draw in others to our church that otherwise may not have had contact with it, or perhaps the event hasn't been here where they feel comfortable. This is a great way for kids to feel comfortable around others and engage in a lot of fun while learning scripture as well. So please don't miss these note cards in the back narthex. Um, next, we also have our youth group senior high missions trip coming up with Good Neighbors Home Repair. This is happening July 24th to 28th. Um, we will be serving a home most likely in the Pennsylvania area. Uh, it is a low income home, most likely has been fairly deteriorated over the years uh, within about 30 to 40 minutes of EP. Please keep the youth in prayer as they are continuing to raise support in order to go on this mission trip as well as keep in prayer that the homeowners that are being served would have the Holy Spirit already now preparing their hearts for when our youth arrive. Uh, we also pray that our youth would be able to share the gospel in meaningful, tangible ways. Um, our youth group, Junior High, also have a mission trip coming up. I told you it was a busy month. Um, they are going to Sunday Breakfast Mission from August 3rd through 5th. The youth will be serving the homeless and low income through a variety of, of needs, including packing backpacks for the back-to-school drive, sorting goods, cleaning, providing many other um, uh, projects, accomplishing many other projects in order to help. So a few, th a few ways that you can be involved with this if you are interested. Uh, we will be hosting this group the youth overnight here at EPC. So we will have a need for several volunteers to sign up to help with food. Uh, there's really only two evenings that we're looking for help with, um, but if you'd be able to serve, please do let Caleb Evans or myself know. Um, in preparation for this mission trip as well, you've probably already seen announcements in, in the newsletter or otherwise. There's also a table in back. We are beginning to gather uh, back to school um, backpack filling items. The Sunday Breakfast Mission has a back to school drive uh, each and every year and this summer, especially because our youth are helping with packing backpacks, 
Um, we are seeking to fill dozens of backpacks with goods for, for children who cannot afford school items to be able to go to school well prepared. So if you're able to bring an item and drop it off at the back table, that would be wonderfully helpful. You can take a look in the newsletter otherwise for additional uh, details, including what items they are looking for. They are looking for specific items. Um, now, one, two, more, two more things. Um, so first, I wanted to give a big thank you to everyone who helped to volunteer at Shoe Metal Middle School. Uh, several weeks ago. We had over 22 youth and adults come to serve a school that's only four minutes down the road. The school looks incredible, and so many of our volunteers volunteered for anywhere between four and eight hours. If you're doing the math, that's um, nearly 123 work hours, um, all shifts being added up, and they spread it over 18 yards of mulch. The school looks amazing. So again, thank you for your service. Thank you for your hard work. Uh, the school administrators are very excited that they can take pride in the school, um, that they are able to show off their school uh, to students and hopefully make it a more inspiring learning environment. Uh, this Tuesday, our youth are going to Rehoboth Beach for a beach day. We are still looking for one to two drivers. If you, are, if you like the beach and you're interested in helping drive some youth, please do let Caleb Evans or myself know. It's going to be a, a fun trip, and you're welcome to join us. And then lastly, the young adults are gathering after church uh, for a fellowship over food, and they are, and this is a slight departure from the bulletin on page 10, but they are going to Raising Cane's, which is a restaurant nearby. If you need directions, please do just ask uh, Nathan Rose or myself. Alrighty, let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer. We have a lot of things happening, a lot to be thankful for, and a lot for which to depend on the Lord. All right, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for uh, giving us the strength and the ability to live, breathe, and glorify you. Lord, there is so much happening in the life of our church and it is easy to become focused on the details and miss the bigger picture of what you are doing in us and you are doing in our church community and, and, and in what you're doing in our local community. Lord, you, we know that your Holy Spirit is working in the hearts and minds of the people around us. Uh, we ask that you would continue to uh, flame these seeds of faith into, into great uh, great trees uh, that, be, uh, that would bear much fruit, that you would use us uh, to further the purposes of your kingdom, that you would uh, use us to inspire, to energize, to answer, to draw in others to you. Lord, we pray for these mission trips in particular as our youth seek to embody um, this missional spirit that you have called us to. We ask that you would give them boldness and we begin preparing their hearts now uh, for these mission trips, that they would be able, when the time comes, to give an answer for the faith that is in them. Lord, we ask uh, that you would also inspire our volunteers, our leaders, and the, the youth who come to Vacation Bible School, that they also would already begin getting primed by you to be ready to hear the word that is to be preached each and every day. That our volunteers would be filled, abundant with love to give as they are filled up by you. That they'd be able to pour into the youth who come to Vacation Bible School. That this would be a transformative work in our community that is not limited within our church walls, but instead expands uh, the gospel's reach into the surrounding communities. Lord, please use us in reaching others who have need. We also thank you for the generosity of, of our church in the past as we have served with Shoe Middle and many other nonprofits and missionaries in the past too. Lord, thank you for all that you've done and you continue to do in those spaces. Uh, we also lift up our missionaries of uh, just a particular highlight this month, Jamie and Jackie uh, Gildard. Uh, these missionaries to France have been serving for many years, and we want to thank you for their continued service, their dedication, and their long suffering. Lord, we uh, want to thank you that they have found a house in a very competitive market, 
and that even as all these transitions have been taking place, uh, that you would give them the ability to be very intentional, highly authentic, with the ability to focus on the people uh, that they are coming into contact with. We know that through shared hobbies, church visits, or even running errands, they are bumping shoulders with people each and every day, and it often is in a very brief encounter that they find someone else who is interested in hearing more about Christianity. So, Lord, we ask that the Spirit would spur new conversations for these missionaries, that these conversations that they are having would deepen into life-transforming conversations where the gospel is opened up and the Holy Spirit um, is, is welcomed into their lives, and that their church would continue to grow as people in France explore uh, what it's like to have fullness of life. Uh, Father, we, uh, we also ask that you would be with those who are struggling with pain and, and, and chronic challenges. Um, there are many people in our congregation who continue to wrestle uh, with health in some way. We ask that you would give them perseverance. We ask that you would give them encouragement in the weeks to come, and that, Lord, you would alleviate the pain that they experience as well. And for those who recently um, had surgeries also, including um, Alice Heidel and um, the recent time in the hospital, Grace Valano, Lord, would you please be with them and, and aid the healing process? Would you give them a speedy recovery and enable them to be back on their feet in short order? We pray this all in your son's holy name. Amen. All right, as we, as we turn toward um, tithes and offerings, I, I wanted to start with Psalm 24. Psalm 24 says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell within. And in so many times and places, Scripture reminds us of this fact, that the power and authority of God stretch into every single space, even our work and money. And so as part of our worship to God, we give back to him what he has first blessed us with. And so for those who feel led, uh, you can give in a box at the back of the narthex. You can give online, or the ushers will be coming forward momentarily as well to take your offerings. And if you are a visitor, please do not feel any obligation to give today. We are overjoyed that you are with us this morning. Let's pray. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you have provided for us. For the seasons of abundance and the seasons of hardship, Lord, you have gotten us through them all. We ask that you accept our offerings today as an extension of our worship to you. In your son's holy name, amen.
please turn in your bulletin to page six for O Come to the Altar.
Please be seated. And please turn with me in your Bibles to uh, Psalm 63. Psalm 63. As I mentioned earlier, uh, last week we finished a sermon series on fighting spiritual battles. Um, you know, we can get tired uh, when we're fighting um, in the army of the Lord. And he intends for us, though, uh, to be replenished. And that is the very thing that worship does for us. It replenishes us. It restores us. It renews us. And there is no better book that guides us through what it's like to be replenished through worshiping God than in the Psalms. And so today we're going to take a look at Psalm 63, and so if you would, please read with me, starting at verse 1. Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory, because your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food, and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. When I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night, for you have been my help, and, I, and in the shadow of your wings, I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. But those who seek to destroy my life shall go down into the depths of the earth. They shall be given over to the power of the sword. They shall be a portion for jackals. But the king shall rejoice in God. All who swear by him shall exult, for the mouths of liars will be silenced. This is the word of the Lord. Let's go to him now in prayer. Lord, we... Uh, we thank you for your word, but Lord, we also need your spirit. Without your spirit, these words will just go in and out of our minds, and we will pass into the next week unchanged, but with your Holy Spirit, with you coming and illuminating our minds and, and softening and warming our hearts towards you, we will be changed, and that's, a, that's exactly what we pray right now. So as, as I preach this word, give me the words, but Holy Spirit, help our hearts to receive it. And we pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, I was reading in an article in Christianity Today this past week about uh, the story of Hannah Wilt. Uh, in 2017, Hannah Wilt was a senior at Covenant College, uh, and at 22 years old, she was healthy captain of the track team and looking forward to graduating with all of her friends and starting a new life. But all that changed when she woke up one morning with extreme abdominal pains. And that led her to doctor's visits, which led to several more doctor's visits. And she was tragically diagnosed with a rare form of cancer called abdominal mesothelioma. It's a, it's a condition that's usually associated to exposure to asbestos. And then two years after her diagnosis in 2019, family and her, uh, uh, Hannah and her family found out from the FDA that trace amounts of asbestos was found in a batch of Johnson & Johnson talc powder, which is a product she used daily uh, for years. And allegedly... The company even knew about the asbestos when they, when they sold the product. And so her family, along with 38,000 others, filed a lawsuit against Johnson & Johnson, which to this, to this day is still not resolved. 
And I'm going to get I'm going to spare you all the 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 difficult painful details of her treatment but but Hannah endured multiple surgeries and chemotherapies that did not slow the spread of the cancer and in a matter of 5 years Hannah had her, had her health taken from her she had her future of a hope of future hope of a career and a husband and children all that taken from her and eventually her life taken from her. She, Hannah passed away in February of last year, and she never saw justice from Johnson & Johnson. But before she went home to be with the Lord, she wrote this book entitled, I Would Live For You. And it, it's a book that I've, I've read, and it's, it's a bunch of poems and her thoughts that are some of the most raw emotions, some of the rawest emotions, some of the most beautiful expressions of worship that I've ever seen a person write outside of the Bible. And so the question is, is how does a person in the midst of so much loss and pain and uncertainty, how does a person like that worship God? Well, that's what Psalm 63 is here to answer for us. Some scholars call Psalm 63 one of the most beautiful expressions of worship in Scripture, but it was forged out of, the, out of one of the most uh, intense crucibles in David's life. And if you look at the title of the psalm, and that title at the beginning of the psalm at verse 1, it's not just a, it's something that was written after. That was written by David. It was, a, it was a psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. And this links psalm, this psalm 63, to 2 Samuel 15. It was a time when David uh, was running for his life in the wilderness because Absalom, what his son, was trying to take over the kingdom and kill his father, David. So David escapes Jerusalem with a band of his supporters and journeyed out into the desert to save his own life. And so this psalm is forged during a time of tremendous loss and pain for David. He lost his kingdom, he lost his people, and he's on the run from, a, from an enemy who is his own son. It's out of this experience that David shows us what it means to worship. And he does it in three ways, by seeking God, by savoring God, and by stirring your heart toward God. Seeking God, savoring God, and by stirring your heart toward God. Let's, let's first talk about seeking God and how David teaches us to seek God. Um, there are two principles that we learn from David seeking God here. First, David seeks God as a result of a relationship that God has made with him. It's a, it's a result of a relationship God already has with him. Verse 1 says, O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. Now, you have to notice the order here. God's relationship with David precedes David seeking God. When David says, my God, he is using covenant language here. And this language, it traces all the way back to Genesis chapter 17 where God initiated to Abraham and he says, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And then just to give you a little background here, God is the one that initiated hundreds of years earlier than David. He initiated to his ancestor Abraham. And it, he initiated to Abraham when he lived in the land of Ur. And, and Abraham did not know God at all. God was the one who prompted Abram to leave his home and take his family to a land that God promised to Abram. And then later God came to Abraham again and gently redirected him when Abram failed to trust God. And then God came to comfort Abraham when, Abram when he was in fear, when he was afraid. God was always the initiator at every point in Abram's relationship with him. And what you see over time as you read the account of Abram, in, who eventually becomes renamed as Abraham, is that the more that God initiates to Abram, the more that Abram trusts and relies on God. And something similar is true in the case of David here. The reason why David seeks God in the first place is a result of God seeking David first. And this is precisely what Jesus meant when he said in, in John 6, 44, no one can come to me unless the Father, what? Draws him. Unless the Father draws him. And this is important for two reasons. 
First, for those who, of you who are out there seeking God this morning, be encouraged because you are not alone searching for a God that might exist. You're not searching for answers that you will never be certain about. If you're seeking God through the scriptures this morning, remember, it is only because he has already started drawing near to you. And that simple truth of remembering that, it, that, that while you're seeking God, while you're thirsting for him, it's because he is already drawing near to you. That simple truth enough is enough to, to warm your heart toward him in worship. But there's a second reason it's important to remember that God initiates to us first. It's because our desires to seek the Lord are divine and given by God himself. They are, des they are divine appetites. When he draws near to us, God gives us a supernatural appetite for the divine. It's almost like he gives us different taste buds in, in, our, in our spirituality. You know, once we were craving sugar and cookies, and then now we've been changed to, to crave more than anything broccoli and vegetables. And when you're, when you're given this appetite for the divine, that leads to a second principle. David, in his appetite for the divine, he seeks God above everything else. Above everything else. You know, continuing on in verse 1, David says, Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Water. David is seeking God above all else. And we cannot underestimate how much of a, of a miracle it is, it was for David to be seeking God above everything else. Because we've already heard about the circumstances that David is in right now. He lost his kingdom. He lost his people. He is on the run in the wilderness where there isn't a whole lot of water and food. And he's running from his life, from his son who want, who's his enemy. His circumstances are dire. So think about this question. You know, when our lives are, are falling apart, like David's is right now, what does our prayer request look like? What are we praying for? God, help my life, put my life back together. Give me relief. Rescue me from this situation. But what we notice from David here, it is a miracle. David, you know, he doesn't say, you my soul thirsts for deliverance from my enemies. He doesn't say, my soul thirsts for food and water in this desert. He does not say, my, my soul thirsts to be safely back in my palace and have my family put back together. What he says is, my, my soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So this is how you can know that you're truly seeking the Lord, that you have the saving faith that, that David possesses, is that you are seeking him above any relief from your circumstances, above any pleasure or convenience or anything else in this world. Now, that being said, we often don't begin there do we? We don't begin in that place. We begin by asking God for the things that we see, the things that we feel in this world, for relief, for health, or something that we really want. But if you have been given that divine appetite for him, you won't stay there. Because when you taste of the sweetness, you will eventually arrive at the place where you're seeking him alone for his own sake. That's what it means to be given this appetite for the divine that only God can give to you. And if you remember, in the book of Job, Satan's accusation against Job was that Job loved God only for what Job could get from God. In Job 1.9, Satan says, does, does Job fear God for no reason? You have protected him and you've given everything that he's ever wanted. But if you take away all that he has then you'll see what his devotion is like. And you know, Satan was right about one thing. If Job had served God only because of what he could get from God, he would not have truly been devoted to God. He would look at God as a vending machine. And the same is true for us. If we seek God just because of what we can get from him, even if those are good things, you know, Coming to church because you want your marriage to be strong is a good thing. 
but it's not God. You know, bringing your children with you to church to raise them up with moral values, those are good things. But if that's the reason why you're coming, you're not coming because you're really seeking God. You're seeking Him so, so that you can get something from Him. The true test of whether or not you're seeking Him really is how you respond to unanswered prayers. You know, I've met people who say they don't want to have anything to do with God because they cannot believe in a God that would let this painful thing happen in their life. And that, honestly, it just reveals the real reason why they're devoted to him in the first place. They were only concerned about what they could get from him. But when we seek God, not just to get stuff from him, but only to get God himself, that is what honors him. So to worship him, that's the first point. We must seek him for his own sake. But secondly, we not only seek him, but we also savor him. Him. We savor him. And there are three principles we see with how genuine, a, a genuine believer savors God. We savor him by remembering, comparing, and expressing. Remembering, comparing, and expressing. Let's talk about how we savor God by remembering. In you know, verse 2 and 3, they say, So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. So what, what David is doing here is he's looking back at a time when he experienced the beauty of God and beholding his power and his glory. You know, some commentators think that David is talking about a literal sanctuary where he was in corporate worship like what we're doing this morning. Uh, some commentators think he's talking about a figurative sanctuary uh, like in his personal worship. You know, I think that he, he, he could mean both here. David is savoring God as he remembers the encounters that he had with God's power and glory. And I've seen, you know, this in many ways in my own life. And, and, and a lot of times it comes at some low points. You know, some of you know about the struggle that I have with anxiety that, that's been on and off throughout my whole life. And there have been times when I've felt terrible anxiety and worry over a situation and I, I just can't get my mind off of it. And my wife, she'll come up behind me and gently say, you know, Chad, do you remember what God did in 2006 when he bailed you out of this situation? And do you remember in 2012 when you, you, you were worried but God came through for you? And on and on she will go until pretty soon the worry begins to melt away and it turns into worship for me. And there have been times when I've been angry with God because I felt like he deserted me in times when I felt like I needed him most. And through my wrestling with him in scripture and prayer, he revealed that he was there the whole time. And I realized you were really there. And I'm just blown away by, surprised by, by, by his care and his comfort behind the scenes. And there have been times when God would encourage me through a sermon or through a friend or through a Bible study where I see his holiness or his power or his splendor or his graciousness in a new and, and beautiful way. And in these moments when I'm remembering, I'm savoring him. But we can't just stop there just by remembering. We gotta compare. We compare our encounters with the living God to everything else in this world. And that's what he's doing here in verses two and three. He said, I looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and your glory, because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. When David says better than, he's comparing the beauty, glory, and power of God to everything, to life. And obviously, if David says that it is better than life, it's also better than anything that this life can offer. It's better than family, than health, than food and freedom and politics and friendship and sex and job satisfaction. It's better than productivity and books and hobbies and games and music and homes or vacation. Anything that you can imagine, it's better than. Now for this to happen, for you to experience God this way, 
your experience of God, it cannot remain in the theoretical abstract. If we're going to savor God better than anything else, God cannot remain in the Sunday school classroom. You can't just leave him here on Sunday morning, go off to Monday at work and leave him behind. The spiritual experience of God, it has to break into your physical reality. And you can see this. You can see this in David's language. He says, my soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food. Now, obviously, he doesn't mean your literal stomach is going to be filled up by God. He means that he experiences such a great delight in God that it's better than the very best and rich food that money can buy. And David uses this kind of language frequently in the Psalms. You know, Psalm 34, 8, taste and see that the Lord is good. You know, Psalm 27, 4, one thing I ask from the Lord, this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. You know, he's not talking about literally seeing with our physical eyes or literal, you know, tasting with our, with our taste buds. He is speaking of a supernatural appetite that I referred to earlier, and he is pushing against the limits of what human language can communicate here. He has to resort to describing it in terms of our five senses, what we can taste and see and, and, and touch. And he says, it is better than anything. This is the mark of truly savoring God. You find him so beautiful that you would be willing to part with anything. You would be willing to reorder your life in order to have more of him. You know, this reminds me of a, one of my favorite stories in the C.S. Lewis uh, uh, Chronicles of Narnia series. It's, it's the book, uh, The Horse and His Boy. And, and one of the main characters in The Horse and His Boy is a talking horse named Wen. In his stories, if you're not familiar, the animals actually talk in there. It's a children's book. But there's this, there's this moment when Wen encounters Aslan. Now, Aslan, in these stories, it represents Christ. And there's this scene where, in the book where Wen sees Aslan for the first time. And I'm going to pick up reading here. It says, Wen had good reason to have her mouth wide open with staring eyes because she saw an enormous lion only it was a brighter yellow, and it was bigger and more beautiful and more alarming than any lion she had ever seen. And then, when, though shaking all over, gave a strange little neigh and trotted across to the lion, and she said, Please, you are so beautiful. You may eat me if you like. I'd sooner be eaten by you than fed by anyone else. I'd rather be eaten by you than, by, than fed by the hand of anyone else. And those of you who are believers, those of you who are Christian, who have, have savored Jesus, you can relate to this story, can't you? Let me ask you a question. Have you had times in your life where the eyes of your heart have been opened to God's mighty power, which created the planets and put them on their axes and have you been lost in wonder? Or have you had times where you've caught a glimpse of his holiness, perfect and righteous in all those ways, and even though you have felt unworthy, you can't help but to want to draw near to him? Or have there been times where you have beheld his great wisdom through scripture, and you have just been amazed at how beautiful it is? Or have you ever been blown away by how a holy God would want to draw near to you? In other words, have you ever beheld his power and glory and said to him, you know what, I don't care what you do with me. You can have everything that I own. You can have my life as long as I can have you, as long as I can gaze upon your beauty. I'd rather be eaten by you than be fed by the hand of anything else. That's what it means to savor God. And I'll tell you, 
when you see him as incomparably greater than anything else, and you know that he is yours, he has a way of melting the suffering in this world, melting your experience and the suffering to make it bearable. You know, he's not going to spare you from suffering because we all have to endure it in this fallen world, but he will come in and he will help you bear the worst of it. David says in verse 6, I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night. You know, when we're not able to sleep at night, when we're kept up in the middle of the night, what are usually the reasons? Might be, it, it, it's certainly because you're troubled about something. Might be because you're angry at being hurt by somebody. It could be because you are sad about how certain situations turn out poorly. But often it's worry that keeps us up. Worrying about your health, worrying about a loved one, worrying about things that are outside of your control. And what David is teaching here is that our spiritual encounters with God have a way of breaking through into our, our physical realm, being brought to bear on the concerns of real life. And his love and his care and his sovereignty and his beauty and his splendor, it becomes even more tangible than anything that we could worry about here. Any hurt that we can experience. You know, look at David here. He had lost his kingdom. His life is threatened. But you don't see one hint of worry in this psalm. Now, sure, he, he probably started there. He started from a place of worry. But as he beheld the glory of God, he did not stay there. And so it is when we savor God. When we savor God, and this works with all kinds of hurts in our lives, all kinds of offenses, all kinds of worries. When we savor God, his forgiveness and his compassion toward us will be so tangible. It will reduce the size of any hurt committed against you. Just reduce it in your heart. You know, when you're savoring God, his beauty will be so intoxicating, it becomes more real than any two-bit monochrome temptation like pornography. And you will say, I'll, why would I ever go to that? Because I have this. You will find, when you, when you savor him, you will find his sovereign care so convincing, it'll become more real than any threat you might worry over. So, so that's what it means to savor. We savor God by remembering. We savor God by comparing to the incomparable God. But we also savor God by expressing. And this is mentioned multiple times in verse 3. He says, my lips will praise you. In verse 4, I will bless you as long as I live. In verse 5, my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. And in verse 7, I, in the shadow of your wings, I will sing for joy. And what David is teaching us here is that you cannot fully savor God until you share it out loud. It's got to be expressed. C.S. Lewis, in his book, uh, Reflection on the Psalms, C.S. Lewis really wrestled over the idea that, that God commands praise from his people. And, he, and the reason why he disliked the idea is because... He felt like it made God seem like a vain, insecure woman needing compliments. But then a thought occurred to him that made it all make sense to him. Why God commands his people to praise. And he said in his book, The most obvious fact about praise, whether of God or anything, I strangely overlooked. I thought of it in terms of paying someone a compliment for their sake. But I had never noticed that all enjoyment spontaneously overflows into praise. The world rings with praise. Lovers praising their mistresses. Readers praising their favorite poet. Walkers praising the countryside. Players, players praising their favorite game. My earlier struggle to understand the praise of God happened because I absurdly denied us doing for God the supremely valuable what we delight to do, what indeed we can't help doing about everything else we value. I think we delight to praise what we enjoy because the praise not merely expresses, 
but completes the enjoyment. It's its appointed consummation. So let me illustrate for a moment what C.S. Lewis is talking about here. You know, last year, Pastor Don and I discovered Pamela's Cafe just about three minutes around the corner from the church. And the first time that we ate there, I was overwhelmed with how delicious the food was. I was and, and how big the portions were and how affordable it was. I still remember my first order. It was the Chick Chick Sandwich. Okay? It was the biggest, tastiest chicken sandwich I've ever had, and it was only for nine dollars. It was a delightful experience, but you want to know what completed my joy? Is when I got on the phone and I talked to Brian Warshaw about this sandwich. And you know what happened? Two days later, he gives me a call and he says, man, I had this sandwich and you were right. It was incredible. And we sat there and talked about it for a while. My joy was made complete. When we talk about what we delight in, especially when we share it, with others, it takes our joy to another level. It completes it. And if that's true about a sandwich, how much more should that be true about God? Our savor in God is incomplete until we express it. And it is really taken to another level when we share it with others. And that is why, friends, Sunday morning worship is so important for us. That is why we get together in Bible studies and we talk about what's in God's word and what he is doing in our lives. We complete our joy by expression. And so we, seek, we, we worship God by seeking him. We worship God by savoring him. But here's the problem. Here's the problem. What do we do when, when our hearts are not in it? What do we do when our hearts are hard and cold and we don't feel like savoring him? We don't feel like seeking him. How do we get to that place where we seek and savor God? Well, we have to turn to the last point, and this is where we end. We have to stir up our hearts toward God. Now, what is it that stirs up David's heart? We can see it in verse three. It says, because your steadfast love is better than life. Now that Hebrew word that's translated steadfast love, kesed, it's one of the most important words in the whole Bible, and it has such a re- rich meaning. Steadfast love really doesn't do it, okay? And it's difficult to completely translate it, but, but one person put it this way, which I think gets at the meaning. It means the always loyal, always pursuing, never stopping, never giving up, never turning away, never letting go, always and forever love. That's a closer definition. Obviously, they can't put that in the ESV. The basis of this love toward David, it traces all the way back to Genesis 15. Yeah, Abraham again, David's ancestor. When God came to Abram and told him that Abram, I'm going to be your God, and you're going, to be, um, you're going to be my son, and all your descendants after you. I'm going to be their God too. And if you remember the story of Abram and Sarah, they couldn't have children. They were too old. And so Abram, he is really skeptical over this, and, and he says to God, how am I going to know that you're going to make good on your word and give me descendants? And then this is what God did. God asked Abram to prepare an ancient ceremony to seal his promise to Abram. He told Abram to get a bunch of animals and sacrifice them and cut them in two, uh, cut them in pieces and put them in two rows. And this is the way that that covenant ceremony would go. Two parties that made promises to each other What they would do is they would hold hands and those two parties would walk in between those slain animals. And they would say, as they're walking through those slain animals, if either of us break our promise to the other, may I become like these slain animals I'm walking through right now. That's the way the covenant ceremony normally works. But God made a significant change to that ceremony. When it came for time... When it came time for God and Abram to go through those pieces together, 
God put Abram into a deep sleep that made him unable to walk through the pieces. And God, in the form of a fiery pot, went through the pieces alone. And by God walking through those pieces alone, God was saying, in effect, if I break my promise to you, may I be torn apart by these animals. But by Abram not going through those pieces with God, God was saying, Abram, if you break your promise to me, may I bear your punishment by being torn apart like these animals. And so this showed that God would be committed to Abram and his descendants with a steadfast love, even if they were unfaithful to him, even if they turned away. Now, fast forward back from Abram to the story of David. David is, he's on the run. He's, on the, he's in the wilderness in a dry season. His son, Absalom, hates him, wants to kill him. Why was David stirred so much by God's steadfast love that, that would pursue him even though he turned away from God, even though he would fail God? Why was he so stirred up by that, by that steadfast love? It was because David did fail God. David did turn away from God. If you remember what precipitated this whole situation with Absalom turning against David, you'll understand why. It goes all the way back to David having an affair with Bathsheba and then David murdering her husband Uriah because Uriah was so close to discovering the affair. The prophet Nathan came to David and confronted him about his sin. And, and David confessed. He, sin, he confessed he sinned. He repented from it. And then Nathan says, the Lord has put away your sin, but the sword will never depart from your house. Your newborn son is gonna die and there's gonna be division that arises from your own household. And if you remember what took place after that event, you know, one of David's sons, Amnon, he, he raped an, another one of David's daughters uh, and Absalom, uh, to defend his, his sister's uh, you know, honor, he kills Amnon. And then Absalom loses all respect for David because David is losing control of his household. And that's when Absalom wants to kill him and take over the kingdom. And so, yes, David lost his kingdom. He lost his kingship. He lost his people. He was on run for his life. But he, he was in that circumstance with a full knowledge that was all his fault. It was his failure as a king, as a husband, as a father, and as a man. And you can read about, about how depressed he was. You can read about that in, in, in 2 Samuel chapter 15. I mean, he was, he was depressed, but he did not stay there. His sin caused him to run to the steadfast love of the Lord. He clung to that always loyal, always pursuing, never stopping, never giving up, never turning away, never letting go, always and forever love. And this served as the spark that warmed David's heart toward the Lord. Da David saw himself as a sinner, but he understood that God loved him anyway. And if King David was stirred by God's steadfast love toward him, how much more should we be stirred knowing how far God would go to have a relationship with us by sacrificing his own son? You know, because, because a thousand years after King David, there would be another king, a perfect king, who also went out into the wilderness. He went out into the wilderness not as a consequence for his sin, but as a, but as a consequence for our sin. You know, like David, this perfect king he would also say, my God, my God. But he would do it on a cross, receiving God's wrath as punishment for our sin. You know, when we look at God's unconditional love toward us, that is what's gonna stir our hearts toward God. When we come to terms with how great a sinner we are, but then we look into the face of God and we see his arms open up to us. We look into his eyes that have tears 
of joy that we've come back to him, that is what savoring God is. That's what stirring, that's what will stir your heart up toward him. Friends, do you know what I'm talking about? Have you experienced his love like that? Let me close with a, a story of, of Hannah uh, Wilt. Uh, in her book that she wrote before she died, she wrote a chapter entitled, Have You Ever Praised God from a Hospital Bed? And it talks about uh, how in the worst times of her suffering, she saw the sweetness of God. And I, I'm gonna close with reading her own words from the grave. She said, just when I was not sure how much more grief I could carry around with me, I read scripture and all of a sudden I was confronted with all this pain and suffering there in the scriptures also. And the answer we're met with is a God that saves us by dying for us. She said, I became so overwhelmingly aware of God's closeness to me, like a wave that rushed over me. I wept for what I was going to have to do. I wept in the understanding that God was going to be there with me every step of the way, and I wept because I finally understood what it meant not to be alone. You know, most of us will never know the kind of suffering that Hannah knew, and most of us We'll never know the difficulty in our lives like David brought on himself. But you can know the sweet Savior of God's steadfast love that both of them knew, that came at the cost of God's son's life. My prayer for everyone here is that you will seek him, that you will savor him and be stirred by his steadfast love toward you. Let's go to him now in prayer. Lord, we uh, do... Thank you for your steadfast love that never stops, never turns away. It's always and forever. As we behold your power and your glory, may it transform us. May it transform our hearts so that we can reflect back to you the gratitude for what you've so graciously done for us. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Please stand for the final song.
and now receive the Lord's benediction. And now may Jesus, who is the object of our worship, our seeking, and our savoring, may he bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up the light of his countenance upon you and bring you peace. And all God's people said, amen.